Well, hello, and welcome to this live session, live Q&A or, and or live coding session. I hope you all are doing well and yeah, wherever you happen to be. And I'm very looking forward to the streaming session. So of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. You can use uh, the chat. I'm just saying uh, hello right now in the YouTube chat. And I just have a few things uh, that I want to share with you. So just some updates. And uh, yeah, then we can take it to some questions, Q and A's that you have. Um, other than that, um, I can go through some code with you uh, because I actually have an update on my blog application. All right, so uh, first of all, so feel free to say hello in uh, in the chat and where wherever you're watching from. So just some uh, content updates from uh, my side that you can actually see on my blog that I recently uh, published. I actually did a few more videos on the overall topic of um, developer um, effectiveness or developer productivity. So for example, I yeah just wanted to share a few things that helped me quite a lot. Um, for example, how to craft development workflows uh, that put you in this uh, flow state. So which means, uh, you know, how we can come up with a setup that doesn't make us wait. So it's mostly about the waiting times uh, that we uh, have to suffer as developers. And that helps a lot if we can just um, somewhat minimize that um, a little bit. So that's, um, that's one and well some more uh, one that was quite popular with watchers like my tips on how to use uh, IntelliJ effectively because it's it's quite interesting that IDE is uh, IDE is so powerful that I don't know if there's a single person on the planet who knows like all of the features uh, that's uh, that's quite funny because I, I talked to um, some of the developers of IntelliJ and even they don't know you know like all of it because it's just uh, kind of um, well, complex. And um, yeah, I was especially uh, showing the features that I use most of the time. So there's a lot of, you know, like low hanging fruit available, like some features that you can, um, that, you know, make you much more effective when, uh, when knowing about them. So uh, something like alt enter uh, that you can use all the time. So I basically pasted them into this uh, blog post and go through them in the video to just like show them live. And yeah, some some other things like how to manage your task and your time. This sounds like a very boring topic, but it is actually very, very helpful. And it's also a topic um, yeah, that that I kind of care a lot about because it show, showed me over over the years that it makes me just more effective to, you know, take these five minutes to think about what I would like to do or at the end of the day, what I actually um, achieved and, and what helps. And yes, and then in the next video that is somewhat connected is actually why um, we developed yet another task management application that is called uh, day captain that you can um, check out if you like. So that's mostly focused on developer productivity, especially on a, a nice keyboard uh, focused uh, usability or user experience, uh, which is just I think kind of cool to work with and really, really helps uh, getting like, you know, all these things done or these tasks planned and um, in a yeah, minimal uh, amount of time. So it's literally like, you know, using Vim in just like a nicer a program that is a combination of a task a list and a time a timeline or a calendar. And also because I am, I got asked this many, many times why I actually use a Linux distribution as my main system and mostly also why my setup actually looks that weird. So it's like, um, yeah, when I give presentation, then I got asked as many, many times if I use some specialized setup, but it's actually all, you know, the setup that I use all the time. So I'm mostly in this like full screen mode that you see right now with like minimal distraction, because this just uh, helps me a lot. And also there are some some other nice things available. So for example, you can use Docker natively because you're in the same kernel and you don't have to do uh, things uh, there. It's it's kind of uh, kind of interesting. All right. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, just put them into uh, the chat and feel free to say hi. That's always nice to um, read and to see somebody else uh, being around. And this is some of the content uh, that I was uh, sharing uh, recently. Some other thing um, that I came across, which is really, really cool, um, that I started trying out, but still has some, some tiny issues that I actually reported, 
which is the next version of Quarkus, Quarkus 2, which is now uh, Alpha 1, and I checked today that it's still the, the recent version, so it's like an Alpha version. You can try that out, and one feature that's kind of cool, and that I've seen before in the dev mode of Open Liberty or WebSphere Liberty, um, which here is also now included in the dev mode is continuous testing, which means you have an, um, a possibility to run your tests from within that development mode uh, from actually within the terminal, which is kind of cool. If you start your dev mode, like, you know, Quark is dev, dev um, well, you, I guess you can watch the video, then it asks you to press some hotkey, I think E or R or something like that, which then runs your tests, which is quite nice because it runs your test or it starts your, uh, your test just a little bit faster than your IDE would because of some JUnit's uh, init phase, I guess. And this works really, really fast. So literally you hit a key and you get a result quite immediately. And um, this, this works quite well. So I, I tested uh, this out. It, it didn't work with one approach where I used the JaxRS client because this is how I typically uh, do my tests if you follow my, uh, my content on effective testing. But just from the idea that is very pragmatic if you say, hey, you have your command line and you can run your test with one keystroke right away. And it's just a little bit faster than your IDE. It's like, you know, very similar to if you would uh, stuff, uh, run stuff in your IDE and then you get the result. So that's that's one thing. That's, that's how I look at it. And uh, very interesting, exciting. I'm looking forward uh, to that, uh, actually to try this out in, um, in a project when it's a little bit more stable. And... Yeah, so you can you can give that a go on the new Quarkus version um, or the alpha version that's that's out there. Hello. So yes, if you have any question in the chat, please feel uh, free to uh, to ask or feel free to um, to chat a little bit. I um, also want to give you a reminder of. Um, if you don't know about this already, Effective Developer, it's a podcast I'm hosting and uh, where you mostly hear me talking about some uh, all things uh, developer productivity. So it's not just about Java developers, but just like um, being effective um, in, as a developer in general. And also, I sometimes do some interviews with some uh, people who I think are very, very impressive in how they um, do, uh, how they manage their productivity and how they get stuff done. And especially the last uh, episode, the interview with Dr. Venkat Subramaniam uh, was very, very, or is very uh, like popular, like a lot of um, a lot of listeners for that episode, which I think is just really, uh, really cool. Uh, Venkat shares a lot of very insightful um, yeah, information and tips on his um, day or how he manages things. Uh, this episode was a little bit longer, like an hour, but um, yeah, also was very cool talking to him. So I really enjoyed that one uh, specifically. And you can check out uh, that podcast in general. It's available like literally everywhere where, you know, you find podcasts and also on this website here. And yeah, that's uh, pretty much it for the news. I, um, when was that last newsletter? That's, oh, also almost a, year, a month ago. Um, my newsletter, if you don't know about that, you can subscribe there as well, where I'm also sharing, you know, like just what's uh, upcoming there. I was sharing the, that I'm now uh, being self-employed again. So I'm fully uh, focusing on, um, well, helping clients and doing some engagements with uh, workshops and uh, consulting and coaching and how to, well, get better developers and uh, or how to become a better developer and yeah that's just uh fun uh so far so i think we do have a question in the chat or something effective developer podcast was very nice uh with venkat yeah thanks for your words i also really enjoyed uh talking to venkat and i think that was a very cool uh episode and another question in the chat is odin project good i have no clue because I literally hear this the first time so I cannot tell you but let's look into it uh, together and I can tell you my views odinproject.com I was just uh, googling that your career in web development starts here our full stack curriculum is free and supported um, let's view it that's a good question so it looks like a learning path website. I literally hear this the first time. A Ruby and Rails full stack JavaScript foundations. Okay. I don't know anything about Ruby and Rails, but let's see the JavaScript part. I can really recommend a very good JavaScript uh, course from 
um, Adam Bean um, on his video courses, which is, let's see which uh, course that is, um, Progressive Web Apps, I think it's called. I have to t uh, tell Adam he needs to improve his SEO, like how to find his courses, I think it's somewhere yeah it's he has multiple courses. yeah these ones perfect um on web standards web components and um well some some other uh, web apps with uh, some more um sophisticated approaches so i did all of his courses here and i can really recommend them they're online courses i think on vimeo or something like that yeah the, that's the domain and i can really recommend them although adam is very known about uh, uh within the java space he also knew, um it's very knowledgeable in the JavaScript space, especially with his focus on um, just trying to stick to the standards like HTML standards in this case. So um, just that I came across that I actually can really recommend his courses. I don't know any about that. I would actually look into uh, the um, the lessons here because I really like to um, see things that are focused a little bit on the, you know, like essentials that people think they know, but they uh, should learn more about, for example, you know, like how does all of these uh, basic work, um, whether it's web components, whether it's uh, something else here, how to organize your JavaScript code, your six modules, to do list, OOP principles. Okay, this doesn't sound too bad. Um, what I always see with front end or, you know, quite often projects is, and what is, why I actually like this is why I pointed now just to Adam's courses is that um, a lot of these projects and uh, courses are too much focused on some frameworks and not really about the, you know, kind of like standards or the uh, standard uh, ES6 technology. So I don't know about this course that I'm looking at uh, right now. I just say this in general, because with modern JavaScript, you can do a lot, um, even without, you know, uh, needing jQuery or, you know, some other um, uh, some other approaches and even with React or Vue.js, I, I have to say, like for most approaches, just like a plain basic uh, JavaScript is, you know, like kind of fine or, you know, really depends what you're doing. But that's just my uh, point of view, testing JavaScript, JavaScript in the back end, finishing up. So this one seems to be a little bit focused on React, um, which, yeah, I guess is, is fine. So that's just one selection that I'm um i'm looking at uh at the course overview right now so f for me that's the only thing that that sticks out a little bit since i say is you know how balanced is the the outline if specifically there's one chapter about react um but you know like only that one as one particular um example and they seem to be focused with ruby and rails and then i guess react on the uh, front end side so i uh, just keep that in mind that's what i uh, just would comment on in this way and um because you know, that's just like what you're looking into. And again, I don't know um, anything else about this, this project, uh, it just came in the chat, basic HTML structure, um, HTML, blah, 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 this would be okay, that sounds cool, grid layout, I just uh, learned, responsive design, very important bootstrap, okay, yeah, seems seems quite solid. Um, so I don't know about anything else about these prices. It is just with, I guess, JavaScript or, um, you know, full stack JavaScript, courses there might it might be a field where there's a lot of lot of content so um i literally just saw this and uh, the question came in the chat so i cannot uh, comment on the quality or you know like well, what the courses are um the outline looks quite solid to me like it seems uh, reasonable first of all I mean, with javascript it depends a little bit uh, what you want to learn about react or some others um other than that it seems a little bit like you know it's focused on you know, like uh focused on how to get hired because i think at the end there was like a and also you know like getting hired and stuff like that and node.js okay i would more like focus on how to get stuff done like you know if you would for example want to implement your own side project and start from there because uh the difference is then uh, you know you are forced to focus on actually what um you know what moves you forward and not just you know how to get hired but basically how to get stuff done so you're not only buzzword compatible with all of these frameworks but basically you know how it can actually uh, make things work um this is what uh, for example i really like about adam's courses so this is why i can recommend them and i've uh, done them myself but these are my thoughts on that but very nice question your live stream just popped up nice yeah hi What's your website's technology stack? Yes, so that was actually also what I wanted to um, 
show because there's there's a new update for my blog and I mean not a blog update but the update in the blog technology so I'm closing that again which is my blog is that one that you just seen and that actually runs an interesting stack which is some might say that's first of all over engineering but there's a there's a reason for that so the blog technology like under blog and my name dot my name is um, actually at first it was a Java enterprise application so it's not just a static site it's actually a fully blown um, application the reason for that was well first of all for a little bit uh, historical reasons because at first I wanted to to get um, an application that also emits me some metrics um, about the uh, like access about the block entries and things like that but then also it was the easiest way to get a very quick update so what it does it actually runs an application so at first it was a Java E application for which you can see the source code here under this uh, repository and I'm about to update this. So the status as you can see is very old but I just recently uh, literally updated these days updated this to use Quarkus. So what that is it is an application that uses Git especially JGit and it connects to a repo where I'm writing my blog posts in ASCII doc. Why? Because it is a very nice um, um, plain text markup language so I can show you for example why I'm using Linux this is the latest blog post and I can just you know write these things well with some extra syntax for the video for example but it's very you know easy to write I just literally write some paragraphs and and there you go and actually I write almost all of my stuff in ASCII doc like even my newsletter and then I use some automation to just process it further because that's just really uh, effective for me but what this doing is it's connecting to the Git repository and then on the fly it's compiling the um, the entries to HTML and it's actually caching the HTML so it's just a little bit faster. It uses ASCII Doctor J that runs also in Java, and um, I was surprised it worked very very smooth with Quarkus as well. But I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. And then what it does it um, compiles that to HTML and it serves them with well I could say a cache it's actually just a hash map because you know that's more than performant enough um, to deliver all of these entries and then the reason for that is it's super fast in updates when I um, write a new uh, blog post I literally just you know like ping an update and it will get uh, the latest changes from the git and then just display them right here and that works really really well and I've been using this for a long long time and the update here now is that first of all I um, updated this to Quarkus I actually waited a long time this just recently happened because there was literally no need to update it I mean it just did the job and worked so you know why bother uh, this state that you still he see here runs on um, Java E8 with MVC so it uh, uses the MVC standard to do the um, server side uh, the server side rendering, rendering and the action based MVC and it runs that version still runs on Glassfish because Glassfish is being used for Ozark, that's the MVC implementation, and it uses uh, a JSP for rendering. And you know, some JSP tag libraries that just display the date in some formatting. But now I found, okay, this is actually a little bit too much hassle um, in a modern approach. So I upgraded this to use uh, Quarkus, which you will see just in a few days. I uh, just have to finish um, uh, polishing and pushing that. And then, uh, or actually the deployed version, you don't see it here, but that already runs on Quarkus. And um, then this also still uses Ask Dr. J. Um, Ask Dr. J internally uses uh, JRuby, which is quite fun, but it worked flawlessly on Quarkus. That was really cool. Uh, plus um, JGit to connect to Git. So I had to change like very little in that actually. And now I'm using Qt instead of JSP to render the server side rendering here, which is works perfectly well and the new thing is what I wanted to talk about is uh, I have some tags here now like hashtags so this for example is hashtag productivity and then um, you know just some overview site on overall tags so I'm basically tagging my entries because uh, what's quite funny is I uh, what's quite funny I sometimes even myself I'm googling my own blog posts uh, yeah that's more like uh, I'm not happy about this I don't know what it says about my memory but um, I literally you know have to google some solution where I sometimes end on my own blog post and then sometimes I know that I wrote about something but it's kind of hard to find and I have to usually go to the entries page that contains all blog entries which is uh, quite long already and have to just search and I thought okay maybe if somebody wants you know to learn 
uh, or to see all of the entries about, let's say, productivity. And then, you know, now they are tagged. So this is just recently what I came in. I um, added some ASCII doc tag, or I think that's called attribute or something, where I can just tag them and then, you know, add some uh, things where I can go to, I don't know, another uh, another blog post and then you can find them there. So if you're curious, just, you know, follow these um, tags, these hashtags, you can um, check them out. And I'm about to publish the source code for that. So that, of course, will continue to be open source. This one is a little bit outdated, but I haven't uh, I didn't do many updates uh, recently until now. So that's an update on my website. And the other, the rest of my website is actually also written in ASCII doc, but that is just uh, statically generated. So all of the other pages that you see here, except the blog is just um, generated by a, also ASCII doc, but then served by an Nginx. So that update is just a little bit slower because that has to be kind of restarted. Um, it runs on a, in a cluster with Docker containers. And then there is some sidecar container that actually does the uh, git pull update for the Nginx and um, just um, uh, renders the HTML um, on the fly. And then that is updated. So this is kind of like straightforward. Um, but I think the interesting part is the blog post or the blog uh, application, which I'll share about um, soon. So yes, that's that's my website. I actually recently also updated the offerings again. So for example, if you are a colleague or your team would be interested in some of that stuff, I just have now a list of, uh, of topics before I had some more detailed pages. But since I well, I mostly do my client engagements, uh, engagements in a way that I would like to learn more what people actually need. So I always kind of tailor them. So it didn't really make sense to, you know, have some template or some approach to say, hey, you need to learn about this, because all projects differ a little bit. So I just say, okay, that's a rough list of topics. And if you if that kind of matches you, then you know, we can talk and feel free to reach out. And uh, now so I updated this website there as well. Again, also an ASCII doc, that's just a really, I think, uh, kind of cool approach. So let's have a look at the uh, chat. Um, yeah, that was the website's technology ta stack. Thanks for your book. I loved it. Thanks a lot for saying that. I really appreciate it. I'm very uh, happy about that. That was uh, helpful. Uh, what do you think about Visual Studio Code? Very good question. Um, what do I think about it? So I have to update my knowledge every once in a while because in the beginning I could say, well, you know, f forget about it if you're a Java developer because IntelliJ is much more, um, you know, much more powerful, which is, I would say, still true. But uh, I see that uh, Visual Studio Code gets more and more attention from the Java world and a lot of people are very happy with it. Um, so I would definitely recommend, you know, why not just give it a try to try out new things. Um, I know that web developers are also very happy with it. I think it's a little bit more common still amongst um, web and JavaScript developers. Uh, with Java, there's a language support. Um, as far as I know, that's developed by Red Hat, which is very, um, like very powerful. It's still, uh, that's my last status that I know, it is not as powerful as IntelliJ for Java development, but I claim it cannot be because um, IntelliJ, you know, there's a, a whole team f solely focused on that. I mean, I, I guess with uh, with code as well, right, with the plugin. But I think the you know like development power be uh, behind IntelliJ is still uh, is still somewhat bigger. So for you know the more advanced stuff like you know really cool refactoring features and all of that, um, I claim you're more happy with IntelliJ. That's the reason why I use it for. Uh, Java development, especially, or actually, I use it for everything. But I'm also a, a very big fan of IntelliJ, as you probably can tell sometimes from from my content. But um, that's yeah, that's that's my take on it. So I never really used um, I, I used code, but not really, you know, like in a long term way. So I never really uh, used it as my main editor. Uh, I sometimes just like to try out things to, you know, see what's if there's something new and upcoming from uh, from other editors. So I really encourage you to give it a try because why not? That's always nice to look at new things. You don't have to adopt them immediately, but just, you know, uh, try it out because uh, people are very happy with it. Um, what I've seen, it's a little bit more lightweight if you want to use it as more general purpose, like editor or general purpose IDE. If you say you have like a more mixed technology stack, you have a bunch of side projects, some, you know, like uh, front end stuff and, as well, and just want to quickly open up projects, then I would say IntelliJ can get a little bit too too bulky. If you say, you, you know, you need to switch between 
you know, like dozens of, of projects, then I could say, okay, then especially might make sense. Um, I think there's also reason why that's the case, but uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much my take. So I'm not using uh, code. I exclusively use IntelliJ plus uh, Vim. So that's my my two extremes that I use. I literally write everything that's not Java code in Vim. Um, sometimes even you know like other type of code. I do front end development also in IntelliJ. This works really well. Um, and yeah, that's that's about it. Like all kinds of code in, um, in this IDE and the rest in in plain text editors. I'm really happy with that. But that's also because um, I, I really got used to this Vim approach. I don't know about the Vim support in, in code. I'm 100% sure there's also a plugin, um, how well that works, because that's also very cool if you're a Vim user to, you know, like use the power of both to have the uh, text editing features, but also then the IDE support with all this smart suggestions. So that's nice. Um, but yeah, why not, why not give it a go? But that's, that's pretty much my, uh, my thoughts. All right. Um, what are your thoughts about GraphQL? Does it replace uh, REST? Um, no, I wouldn't say replace REST. Uh, GraphQL is a very, very interesting approach, which is uh, unfortunately, or which is very much over, um, over engineering for, all, for almost all the projects. There are some projects where this really makes sense. And especially in, um, in the, uh, the project that I'm uh, working on as a side project, which is my, uh, this up here, uh, which is the task management project I was uh, talking to you about, Day Captain, because this has a very um, kind of sophisticated model that's um, that's underneath with a, uh, some graphs uh, and, and stuff like that, where it would make sense to actually use an access, um, you know, description language like GraphQL. But even then, um, after you know considering some uh, some pros and cons, it, it made more sense to go with the more traditional uh, REST approach and not these you know query languages where you can you know query whatever you would like to need because well it depends on the use cases that you do but mostly they are somewhat uh, straightforward which uh, which type of data you would like to have and that's basically where I would say you know what makes sense if you um, if you have an approach where, for example, you would like to, or where you need uh, to query all kinds of data in a different structure, or especially with uh, loading the, uh, the data with different type of hierarchies, with different type of use cases, where it would make more sense to have a more generic approach rather than some uh, predefined endpoints where you, you know, know which level of depth or level of data you get back, then, um, a traditional uh, REST approach would be better. Otherwise, you can definitely have a look at it. But it's a little bit of a trade-off of saying, okay, when does it actually make sense or pay off? Uh, because, you know, like just of the co complexity involved. Um, so that's that's my take. I, I don't think at all that it will, you know, the, the approach per se will replace uh, the REST approach that we mostly see in projects um, just because of the necessity, whether you need it. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically it. So that uh, depends a little bit uh, on that. I hope that answers the question. Out of context, how do you design non-CRUD operations in a RESTful API? Pod resource, uh, post resource ID actions. Very good question. That's actually very um, interesting on how to how to design something like. Let me share some. Where we go. Vim, there you go. That's just also my regular scratch pad. If I say, for example, post, you know, uh, something like uh, customers, that's easy, right? I, you know, kind of like create a new customer, I post to this customer's resource. Okay, but what if I would like to uh, delete a customer, right? So, okay, well, then that's easy. You could say, just do a delete customer, uh, delete customers, and then, you know, ID one, two, three, four, five. Okay, but what if I would, for example, like to cancel a, a subscription of a customer which needs a few more steps, a few more steps like a, you know, um, like some approvement or confirmation or whatever, right? Or some processing where it just takes a while. Well, in most of these cases, um, what I found quite helpful is if you form your action as a noun, because usually we're talking about these resources as nouns, as the entities in our application, and do something like uh, post, now I deleted it, uh, post customer one, two, three, four, five, slash canc cancellations, plural. So I'm posting a new can cancellation, 
which you know could imply that they potentially could i don't know if you write it in american english do you write it with one or two no with two okay vim says with two l um where you could post a new cancellation that potentially you can have multiple ones or they could have some different statuses but that's fine if you say okay you post a new cancellation this does not mean that your um api has to return a new uh, location header with some you know cancellation slash one two three no this doesn't mean this it just say okay you know you are creating a new cancellation there so i think from the rest restful modeling perspective of talking about these representations of the main entities which is what we typically do we have a domain entity customer like one particular customer and we you know um we are um interacting with that and here the same that we have somewhat, um, you know, an entity object cancellation, which is a user cancellation to, you know, do this. Or then, you know, more generally speaking, actions, you could uh, have this and then just post a new action and say, okay, you know, doesn't matter if afterwards, two seconds later, the action still uh, exists, right? Because the server could and can, um, has the right to change and modify these resources. So that's totally fine as well. Um, and but this is I would say you know like the nicer um, um, modeling of it potentially you could argue well technically doesn't doesn't make uh, or you know doesn't make a difference at all you could also say do some action um, but of course like following the rest uh, approaches that's not really correct because you know there should not be a resource do some action so this should not be RPC remote procedure call rather than we're posting something like a resource we're posting um, yeah, a new URL here. So most of the cases, it really depends what you're trying to do. Maybe you can also follow up with what exactly you would like to have as an um, as an action, as a as a question in the chat. But that's basically um, what yeah what what I would like to do or what I typically do there. So I hope uh, Adrian that that somewhat answers your question here. And in the chat, do you? know some task management similar to Redmine. Um, now I have to think Redmine, as far as I remember, was something like a project management, like, um, you know, collaboration, uh, for which I actually can Google that as well. So, you know, Google is your friend, Redmine. But, oh, because just in case you're wondering, so uh, this uh, program is, uh, is about personal time management. So it's literally about, you know, like my calendar and how to uh, organize my own uh, time that's that's hard enough already <laughs> and um, system software free web-based project management tool yes I remember like ages ago I think in university we were we were uh, using that uh, but anyway um, do I know some well you know I would say that's one I literally haven't used it for years I don't know how that looks uh, right now other than that I would say well, it really depends what you want out of a project management tool or, you know, like how much complexity of features would you like? For example, if you would like to have some Gantt charts to show all of the open open stuff or, you know, if you would rather have something like a Kanban board because there are many, many ways, like the, the most uh, typical ones are either something like Trello um, or, you know, to use Notion uh, to collaborate with it um, or to use actually GitHub issues. That's what I do a lot because it's a very, very pragmatic way if, um, you know, they are solely technical people, then, you know, that that is a very, very um a somewhat yeah pragmatic low level easy way to just share some open tasks or whatever uh, you could even have some um how does this look there's like a i think projects view here in github yeah and then there is zenhub i think that's a browser extension that you can install uh here i don't know what happens now i don't want to do this on my project but yeah something like this and then um okay and then you could create some, I think, workspaces. And then what happens is also similar to Kanban boards. So you can use some issues um, that you have as GitHub issues and then kind of visualize them differently. So that's what I actually would get started with. And then the obvious ones like Jira or, you know, what have you. Actually, it's interesting that you posted Redmine because this is, I just literally haven't heard uh, uh, heard about it for like for a long time now. And um yeah, this wouldn't have been the first that came to my mind, but just like the other ones that I mentioned, I guess that's that's something to uh, start out with. All right. And in the chat, async communication between microservices. In which case would you recommend which of kinds of technologies like Kafka, RabbitMQ, for example? 
um, async communication? Well, first of all, I would recommend really ask yourself the question, why would you need asynchronous communications? Because, or technically um, asynchronous communications. Um, what I mean by that is, if you have the opportunity to go with an approach that is very pragmatic and straightforward, um, for example, to use um, what I call a logically asynchronous approach that you can achieve via um, synchronous technical communication. What that means is, for example, you can use HTTP calls that are just you know invoked in an asynchronous fashion. So there is nothing preventing you from directly calling something with HTTP that is not triggered via a user action directly, but just asynchronously with a you know like timer or polling mechanism or whatever. Uh, which is a very pragmatic way because you solve all other sorts of issues. Um, I would start actually with the eventual consistency and that question, okay, what kind of data or what kind of use case are we dealing with? So first of all, where's the necessity for um, asynchronous um, communication and especially, you know, the, the actual necessity, not just saying, okay, we need to scale to uh, 1 million, like, uh, no, you don't, like, literally, you don't until you really need to scale. And until you did um, measurement that this, you know, whatever other approach you have is not sufficient. So, uh, so not just please not just do it because you can, because it will be more complex, it will have more uh, inherent complexity. And uh, then I would ask the question, okay, wh what is about our data consistency? So for example, when we talk about transactions and you know, all of this, because how do you guarantee that your messages are not being lost and that you have, you know, like um, uh, exactly once uh, delivery or um, as I so also heard the term effectively once delivery, like, you know, like having some um, item potent consumers and stuff like that. So literally what happens if you send a message and should that message be sent like in in theory exactly once which is already kind of you know challenging to achieve that and and things like that so it's really you know about the details so i would first of all ask the question what the you know what the necessity is what the motivations are and then see okay what's what you need from there uh, that's about uh, async uh, uh, communication and which kinds of technologies? Well, really is the question what, you know, like what the use case is, like Kafka is really widespread. Um, all of them are, of course, facing the same issue. So, you know, you um, really have to see uh, following your data consistency, following your uh, requirements for transactions and all of it, and then see, okay, either if there is some uh, knowledge with your current developers, if they have knowledge in some um, technology, if it's easier to set up one thing with your uh, with your infrastructure because operations is a big one on that as well <laughs> because that's you know that's also not trivial whether you know it's RabbitMQ, Kafka, whatever you uh, would like to set up and then take it from there like just in general you know Kafka is very widespread which is also an, uh, a thing to consider you know how uh, widely adopted whatever your options are that technology is um, when you run into issues stuff like that this is what I would uh, look into but for me, the bigger question is, you know, async communication or not in general. And again, whether you want technical async uh, communication or just uh, saying, okay, logically asynchronous, which in, uh, internally can be implemented in different, different ways. So you could have, you know, like it's totally fine to have HTTP communication uh, with some uh, other approaches. It's just more the direct way. And if you um, need to put the asyn asynchronicity or asynchronousness uh, into place, then um, you can do this with other mechanisms as well, like, you know, with uh, firing application internal events with having timers, like uh, retries, whatever. So that's that's my take on that. All right. Which process to learn as fast as possible a new framework or tool? Um, what I really like to do is to take notes and to have somewhat um, a a somewhat, I would say, um, guided approach to um, whatever I would like to learn based on my current understanding. So for example, let's assume I would like to learn a new technology such as Kubernetes. And I literally did, I actually can show you the file. I literally did this on, you know, trying to read through the, well, not trying, I actually read through the Kubernetes documentation and I can really recommend it. It is actually written in a very nice way. And then, you know, I took some notes on my own term about all of these, you see again, ASCII doc format, about all of these components and some stuff. And actually I had some, it was not only components, uh, concepts, yes. Um, 
this is a big one and then i was trying to form that in in form these in my own words so basically what i'm trying to do is i try to first of all understand the motivation and the main concepts of a technology and i literally mean concept like you know first of all why is this a thing like with kubernetes why should i care what issue is it trying to solve you know like hype and coolness is never a good argument like literally tell me what that thing is trying to do and why the hundreds of other things that are out there already are not sufficient and uh, then i'm trying to understand the concepts like in what are the you know like killer feature concept of kubernetes for example that really helped me understand a thing like in kubernetes for example that's a service right like uh, just the the way that it can abstract an application in something like a kubernetes service which does the load balancing and the service discovery for me and all of that is the killer feature of it and you know this really helps for microservices as the name says and once I understood that and how this works and once I understood what a deployment is in Kubernetes and how these parts are being scheduled and, you know, like how I can I forward uh, things uh, to these. Actually, as of uh, as it happens this week, I'm giving a, um, a Kubernetes and OpenShift workshop uh, for a client, which is really fun. And um, yeah, so so just, you know, trying to understand these. Then what I'm trying to do in these notes, so I literally when I read about it or I look at the website, I have a note. A file open here like just some you know plain text file where I literally write okay what in my own words what is it about this technology I, I literally try to summarize in my own words what I just did and I always have like some uh, something like questions I don't know to do's to comprehend whatever something like this that's the ask a doc uh, format right and then I can form just the open questions so literally when I read something and I try to understand it, I'm like, okay, there's a still a question mark in my head. I'm trying to, you know, write this down. And sometimes I even Google them for the other question and some other resource uh, is going to help me. So I really try to uh, fill all of these gaps of the knowledge, like not the knowledge about the technology per se. Like I'm not talking about that you have to learn every detail about Kubernetes. No, you can search that later when you need it. No, it's the understanding about the concept and why this uh, motivation is important. Like if I now would learn about, I don't know, React.js, do we have that before? I don't know anything about it. And um, then I would, you know, start with that. Like what are the most con important concepts there and why are they important? And then, you know, why can I not solve this or why is it better than to solve this um, with plain JavaScript and, you know, things like that. And I try to answer all of these uh, questions then in my head. Um, this idea comes from, uh, there's a nice quote by uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, who said if you cannot explain something in your own words well enough or you know easy enough in very simple terms then you haven't understood it fully so i r really like this quote and i like to think about it this way if you cannot explain a technology like kubernetes to a child to a five-year-old or whatever then you don't understand it well enough because you have to really be able to distill the point, like what's the point of this technology, what are the main concepts, and also explain them on a very different abstraction layer without all of these technical terms, without all of the details, like why, you know, trying to explain to your uh, mom, un unless she works in IT, um, why Kubernetes is a thing. And then trying to, you know, think about, okay, wait a second, how would I explain it without using all of these technical terms? And that helps a lot in understanding and detecting gaps in your knowledge. Like, you know, what is a DNF uh, server component there and why do you need it? Oh, good question. You know, and how does it work or whatever? That's just from a conceptual perspective. And this helps a lot. And for me, these type of node uh, files really help to just, you know, like um, summarize the points in my own words. And while summarizing, if you're honest to yourself, you're like, OK, did I really, really understand it or is there still some gap? And then really deliberately trying to fill these gaps. And this helps a lot when I'm uh, trying to understand um a technology so this is about yeah the process to learn something um, as fast as possible a new framework tool developer thing and that's literally what i'm doing sometimes also with books and then i'm trying to um, summarize these in my own uh, points and that's also very helpful because if you then have such a plain text file of all your notes then l later on i also do this when i'm reading books like non-fiction books um, later on when you read through these again like literally in a few minutes you can remind not in the same depth as before, but even months after, remind yourself of the most important concepts and a lot of things come back into your memory uh, just with, you know, glancing over it for a few minutes. So this is also really helpful once you kind of like summarize it in, in your own words. 
and this is what I do uh, when I learn uh, something new. All right. Wow, a lot of questions and time passes. That's super cool. I'm really happy about this when we have some activity in the chat. For Java developers, is it important to learn also static compiled languages such as C++, C, Rust, or I might add Go? Um, or would it better to go deeper in the Java world? Really depends what your um, what your motivation is and what your field is. I would I would even go as far to say it doesn't matter. I say it doesn't matter because you know what is where is the motivation in your question? If the motivation is like I want to be you know stay employed and look for a job, I can say like that's my own opinion, but I say don't worry about it. We will have tons of legacy Java projects even in fifty years from now that you know you there are more projects than you you can maintain and you will still you know be paid to to do stuff so don't worry about that and uh java is so um you know popular and required and needed like uh, i don't see any shortage of that i would rather see it as a a a personal challenge to learn new things so you you should always strive to you know like learn something cool new and why not learn a new programming language just for the fun of it and have some you know the next side project or fun project that you do just implement it in C++, why not, right? Or if you have some other requirement where you say, hey, actually I'm doing some other work project or fun project where it makes more sense to go for, for example, a statically compiled language. With the advent of Quarkus and uh, especially of things like GraalVM, it is also be less of an issue if you're a Java developer and say, I still need um, something that is being natively compiled, like, you know, a tool that I can use with native performance, especially for command line tools. That's really, really cool. Um, where otherwise, you know, you would need to start up a VM, uh, like the JVM, and that JVM has a lot of overhead and stuff like that. And if you say, I want to just have a small helper tool that just, you know, uh, should run uh, much, much faster or with a lower footprint, that might really, really make sense. So I would, if you're really about this, uh, like resource consumptionness or nativeness, I would look into, uh, especially Quarkus with GraalVM. Quarkus also doesn't have to be only a, a web app. Uh, you can run this as a command line app. There's, it's, I forgot the name, like Quarkus command, uh, something like that. There's like a, um, another way to run this. And then Quarkus command line application. There we go. Quarkus command mode application. There we go. I would look at that and then either compile this because usually I don't care that much about the native compilation in Graal, um, in, sorry, in Quarkus with Graal. I mostly use the JVM mode actually for a bunch of other reasons, but I would use that and then try to compile that down to native. And um, yeah, then you have your native app and that can be a tool or command line stuff or whatever you're trying to do. Of course, if you have another reason like embedded devices or something like that to really go for a different language, then go for it. But uh, you know, don't worry about anything like project related. How can I use a P12 key store with Quarkus microprofile REST client. Um, I would actually like to postpone your question a little bit because I think that requires a deeper uh, research of mine. Uh, good question. I actually have just, I'm thinking about it. Um, if I know the answer to that. So I think you're assuming something like um, SSL certificates on the client side because on the server side that if it's like REST client, uh, that shouldn't make a difference. So for example, install that in a server side, then I'd rather, but that's now just me thinking out loud. I rather think that should be something that you use in your JVM, like in the overall JVM in your key store and not just specific to uh, MicroProfile REST clients. So the easy answer for that without looking into it at all would be um, look into that the client uh, JVM, the JVM that runs the, the HTTP client, um, has the certificate installed or and or has access to the uh, key store. So it's about a certificate, I uh, presume. And uh, you might look into that. But other than that, if it's more, um, uh, if it's more complex, then, you know, please ask the question on Twitter or somewhere else again, because then I need to look into it with more time. Are there any books you can recommend for senior software developers? I'm especially interested in language agnostic books. I think I wrote a newsletter about this with my book recommendations. Let's see. Um, there we go. So what I always can recommend is I think it was, oh, 2018. My favorite, no. Okay, then Google, oh, there we go. Oh, it was a Twitter tweet from 
yeah, 2018. Uh, Domain-driven design, that's, um, that's an uh, all-time favorite and that really, really uh, helps uh, understanding all kinds of stuff that's definitely language agnostic. So yeah, it's not an, uh, I, I hope you, oh, like, if you didn't read it, I hope you read it. If you didn't read it, you definitely have to read it. Uh, I hope you didn't read it, so then it's a good recommendation and you really have to. There's some other books uh, that un, um, especially point out the importance of, well, testing, continuous delivery, um, and and all that stuff. So there's a book called Continuous Delivery that's also in this list uh, that I just posted, um, which I can really recommend. There is a book, uh, Release It. Um, especially the, there's a new version of it that I really can recommend. It's also really fun to to read these, you know, things that can go wrong in production. Uh, so a lot of uh, war stories, and um, that's that's a nice one. Um, also, I'm uh, I was just like finishing reading. Um, oh God, what's the name? Accelerate. Uh, that's a book about the value of continuous delivery and the overall continuous delivery culture. Can really recommend that as well. Um, then I'm uh, I finished reading managing um, data uh, data intense applications data intensive data intensive designing data intensive applications um, the one with the uh, hawk in uh, on the cover uh, that is a really nice one an interesting one it's very you know somewhat language agnostic but very deep uh, low level about not only databases but the o overall motivations and data consistency a really uh, really interesting one um, if you're more into SRE there's a good SRE workbook by Google um, uh, that is interesting so it's a little bit a question of you know what you want to uh, just uh, go into uh, more a little bit or you know which area you would like to learn more about or explore more but I can really recommend these areas because also from experience uh, what is lacking is either uh, you know like domain focus pragmatic choice of architecture uh, in which I really can recommend you know domain driven uh, design and um, a proper continuous delivery approach especially with automated testing and with you know an continuous improvement approach with building building this quality in so as a senior developer i would definitely focus on that because that's what literally what the world needs i see this in projects like there's always a lack of you know like proper uh, sophisticated end-to-end -end tests of proper automation of all of that stuff there's usually over engineering uh, when it comes to the architecture side uh, or you know whether we're talking about on microservices or we had questions about Kafka and all that stuff already so you know like keep it simple keep it pragmatic keep it focused on the business uh, on the domain and try to improve over time especially building quality in and using automation and everything what I just said like books that go into this direction I can really recommend um, especially the ones I mentioned so yes if you need the titles again you can watch the recording <laughs> and yeah so uh, in cloud native field, which one is more promising, Spring Boot or Quarkus? Quarkus. Uh, I might be I might be biased, but uh, I think it's just a very very cool technology for a bunch of reasons. First of all, it enables you to go native. You don't have to, but you can compile it uh, to native. Um, you can do this with uh, with Spring. As far as I know, also I don't know which uh, all of the things that it supports. But what I really love about Quarkus, again, I'm biased because that's originally the technology that I come from, um, with this Java EE um, APIs, like, you know, JAX or S, CDIs, now they are Jakarta EE, um, a JPA and all of that stuff. And it's not just because I like them or not. That's not the point. It is about a lot of developers have knowledge in these technologies uh, just from before as well. So I claim there's probably as much uh, knowledge of these, you know, APIs, how to use them as there is in Spring. And just the approach is very nice that Quarkus takes, not just from an operation perspective with the nativeness that you can do, but also from a developer experience perspective. So that's really, really cool. And that's the reason why I adopted it uh, quite early, where I literally, uh, you know, were writing my projects uh, in that and, and talking about it. Uh, because it's just really fun to program with Quark. It's like to have this dev mode open, um, you know, it works out of the box really, really well. And that's just fun. Uh, and a joy to use and I think this is very underrated uh, to have a proper developer experience because we developers you know not everybody knows it yet but we developers are, are the new kings of you know choosing what what the business use uh, uses you know choosing technologies uh, um, determining the the future of where a, a business and a IT direction goes and if you have a technology that really enables developers to use stuff well 
whether it's cloud environments, whether it's something else, but just developer experience in general, that is really key. And uh, just try it out yourself. If you use Quark, is, you know, it's just really fun uh, to do so, and it works seemingly well. You can use similar things in, in Spring Boot as well. There's Spring Dev Tools, as far as I know. Uh, it's just like, I don't know how it is right now. It's just not that nicely integrated or not like a first-class citizen, as far as I'm concerned, as, as a citizen Quarkus. So, but again, that's just my biased opinion. So I would answer this in that way. All right. So, wow, we are very, very uh, f quickly advancing in time. That's really cool. I'm super happy when you ask a lot of questions in the, in the chat. Um, next question, can I use protocol buffers for my schemas and schema evolution rules to keep all layers of the distributed system in sync? To keep all layers of the distributed system in sync, what do you mean with all layers? Because if, uh, well, a protocol, a protobuf is, well, it's just yet another schema or type of representation. And I would uh, like to say that if you have some system, like some microservice part of your application or your architecture, that should define the endpoint and therefore also the schema that the endpoint offers. Internally, inside that application, like a database schema or something, that's a different story. That should be potentially um, isolated or potentially independent. Uh, you know, like the in independence of the application to choose its own implementation. So if you would like to share some schemas like protobuf schemas, I would not, I'm, I'm not quite sure where your uh, question comes from, I, but I would not recommend that. And then internally all layers of the distributed system seems like, you know, you would like to have multiple technical layers with um, like similar protobuf schemas or entities or something that are then in sync, which I don't think makes sense just from how you would like to model your domain entities, because it really makes sense to keep the freedom in modeling your entities like however you like. Even if you have multiple applications that use the same entity, they might need the freedom to model these same entities in different representations, which makes sense because you might talk about the same customer, but a different application needs different properties of that customer, which is totally fine, which is actually what uh, domain driven design that books also talks about. So I don't think that what you're trying to do makes sense, but it might be a little bit more complex question, you know, what you mean with this layer. So uh, using the protobuf uh, defined data structures, modeling databases, such as dynamic storage models exposed in the API. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, DynamoDB RDS storage. Okay, then you're using a similar approach like I typically do when I use one Java class and both model or use the class within a an entity like an entity bean for my database for the persistence where for example, I add some um, JPA annotations and on the other hand also exposing that same entity uh, with for example, a JSON mapping. So then it's the same approach that you say, okay, you want to write that one thing once and store it both, you know, like on, on all the, the whole spectrum in your application, like in your persistence and your endpoint, for example. Um, yes, you can do this if still the application has the technical independence, at least the potential uh, independence of changing things, at least internally. So from the outside, you say, okay, you're offering an API, which is a specific schema, whatever, and you should have some mechanism in place, like a system test that validates that this contract is being met. If then internally you change stuff, that's totally fine. And if you say, well, I don't need to change stuff. So my representation on the database always looks similar to my representation in the endpoint. That's okay too. I do the same and you know, like with Java, JPA, JSONB, JSONP, whatever that I use the same um, approach or actually JSONB, like a declarative JSON binding. If nothing like changes in your entity, you don't need separate entities. You can have one and just model both kind of edges. Um, just once something changes, you should be able uh, to reflect that change individually as well. So you might keep yourself the door open to just change the entity or basically refactor your application that you then have two entities, which should not change the representation to the outside world. So yes, then that's fine. So it's fine to use the same and then just, you know, like use some schemas. If you say, well, you change both things at the same time. Okay, that's fine. All right, what architecture would you uh, advise to semi-complex Greenfield backend application, Java Spring Boot? Are you opinionated on NT onion vertical slice architectures, Jimmy Bogat? 
Um, yes, so uh, Java sounds like a good option. Spring Boot, if you're familiar with the Spring World, yes, definitely. Otherwise, I would look into, like these days, I would look into Quarkus or something similar if you have some other requirements. Um, opinionated, so architecture as simple and pragmatic as possible. Like literally, if you have a single like application, a single somewhat thing, a uh, single component, I would start with one deployment. That's literally like, you know, one application. It can be, have multiple instances of the same application, that's fine. But one thing that you also module as one thing, which means your project, whether you use Maven or Gradle, should be one module. Like don't use multi-modules for all kinds of stuff just for the sake of architecture. If you say, oh, I have three tier because everything has three tier, like a technical layer, no, why, right? So um, for example, if you would structure uh, something like that, like th there's no need to, um, unless you actually have a requirement to have multiple deployment units. But if you uh, deploy everything as a single thing, please keep it in one project. And then internally, what I would like to have is, I like to slice it vertically in just a way or, you know, uh, or like onion way, if you uh, like to think about it this way, but I, I like to First of all, think about, again, from a domain perspective, that's why I also pointed to domain-driven design, what are the, you know, like categories or domain, you know, like slices, however you want to shape them, um, in your application. That means, are we talking about customers? Are we talking about orders? Are, are we talking about, I don't know, uh, coffee uh, orders, coffee beans, and, and things like that, and have package names that follow these structures and then you typically end up with Java packages that are quite small already. And if you then inside these packages need another technical um, uh, representation, such as, you know, this is the entry point for my use cases, sometimes called boundary. And this is then, you know, like some of my entities that I use. This is some like other technical stuff. You can further do that. Often that's not even required. If you just like have a, you know, thing about coffee orders and then you know you have five classes in that package well that's fine right so just be very pragmatic this is what i would say i sometimes like to follow um, this boundary control entity pattern uh, that adam bean also uh, talks a lot about which is just very pragmatic i think so it basically follows that approach first that you slice first vertically and then you have an you distinct you distinguish between a boundary which is the entry point of your use case so every you know like of these kind of modules or packages should have the entry point for a use case what you're actually trying to do like create a new coffee order or customer and the um, controls sometimes if you know you have further logic that you would like to delegate to so-called controls um, from your use case and you all have so-called entities which are the nouns which are typically the domain entities you have in your project and this is what i uh, what I do, but just in general as a recommendation, keep it as pr pragmatic as possible because there are too many over-engineered projects out there already. So, you know, um, yeah, keep that simple, but, you know, just simple but organized, but organized in a somewhat reasonable way. Not overly organized for the sake of ordering stuff, but just for the sake of, okay, it's actually, I can find things here. All right. Are your runtimes or tools like Raw VM much faster than a standard, a standard JVM? It depends. That's the best answer you can have as a consultant, by the way. The answer to everything in life is it depends. Um, Quarkus, OpenJ9, I love, for a colleague of mine, actually did a nice representation of, um, that's him, Niklas, uh, or comparison of Quarkus uh, with a native mode and um, Quarkus plus JVM and OpenJDK, but what's actually very cool is the is to use OpenJ9, which is another JVM flavor that I mostly use as my typical Java, um, which is post customers, which is the OpenJ9 uh, um, J9 via adopt OpenJDK built, which is actually a little bit uh, faster, which comes from the background as a well originally was designed for embedded uh, stuff. And that is somewhat um, a resource comparison, but it's also a question of throughput. And um, well, you know, it's 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 like a um, should I say triangle or whatever? Like a bit, uh, it's a comparison between startup time, between resource consumption, and throughput. And you somewhat have to think what you um, you know like need in this regard because a standard JVM is actually so it is a 
for to answer your question, are runtimes like GraalVM much faster than a standard JVM? Definitely not, especially not much faster. It, there can actually be uh, reasons when a JVM is faster than some other uh, stuff. You might ask, oh, why? Well, because the JVM optimizes stuff uh, along the way, thanks to Hotspot, uh, like the just-in-time compilation, that optimizes things as um, as they as they go as they run further and further so the longer applic the application runs the better which is because in the past we optimized stuff for long running applications like stuff that was deployed for a long time now um, with different uh, operating model like we have here there are some different approaches so do i want to optimize for startup time like really do i have a use case where i want to well that's basically needed when i want to um scale to zero where literally i have nothing running and then at the first request i would like to as quickly as possible pop up something well then i need to be in the millisecond area and then it really makes sense to have something native because that is by far the fa fastest startup time if you run stuff longer then it really depends actually with the throughput with the actual performance that you get and then of course also resource consumption so this for example uh um, compares the resource consumption and I can say and I've tested this myself if you use a different runtime or if you use OpenJ9 spe uh, specifically this really really lowers your resource consumption by doing nothing else than just swapping the JVM which is really cool and um, I also blocked about this before actually J9 quarters by swapping yes um, the JVM which is really nice if you use docker because then literally you change the base image um, and that's it and this is what I'm doing now for almost all of my applications especially for the longer running stuff so if you have longer running stuff it might actually not even you have to measure it but it might not be even much of a performance improvement if even uh, to use GraalVM and the native approach uh, so it's, uh, that's the other thing about that plus if you say if you don't need to scale to zero like zero if you still have one um, instance running then this st uh, a small startup time isn't even that important because you know we have load balancing and then if your application quarkus is also really fast if it starts up in one second you know compared to 100 milliseconds or five seconds even that's fast enough that's still super fast so that really depends what you want um what's your favorite tech stack and why that's a little bit of a broad question like it really depends what so i'm a java developer i use java for almost everything also for you know like small helper and day-to-day -to -day tools but that's really just because why because i'm most familiar in that language and i'm really really fluent in that so this really makes sense um what i typically use for other type of projects when it's a web app uh, project in some uh, sense then typically it's quarkus just because it's a very very good solution that works with most of that stuff sometimes it's some more like traditional quote-unquote uh, ee runtimes uh, i use open liberty also still um, a lot or regularly which is also very cool a modern runtime um, other than that it's it's mostly this actually for front-end development i don't use any frameworks at all not even jquery i now you do like uh, plain es6 like plain, plain javascript with a uh, modern uh, css3 approach that is just like works really well but i'm also not you know like um doing super complex uh, sometimes um front-end stuff and that's most of my uh stack and then tech stack for all of my environment well i pointed to this Linux uh, video before what I'm losing using on my system uh, but for development that's mostly mostly it and another very favorite stuff that I'm doing is bash scripts why Bec or automation on the command line in general why because they're super super pragmatic I am not an expert on that either although I wrote hundreds of them um, but I still have to google the syntax I'm not a fan of the syntax actually at all so I don't consider it a very nice like language I guess but it's very, very pragmatic and it helps you a lot, especially if you're on a Unix environment. And these days I will publish another video on my favorite automation scripts that I use in my system um, all the time. So yes, um, looking at the time, I uh, think we're gonna wrap up for this live Q&A section. There were a lot of really, really good uh, questions uh, in the chat. And I really appreciate that you all took the time to um, uh, paste them in um, and also took the time to attend and yes I hope you're uh, all doing well wherever you stay um, and keep uh, safe and healthy and I'm about to uh, as promised uh, post this open source uh, ASCII block application that is now being updated on Quarkus and yes please stay tuned and all that stuff uh, that I was showing you feel free to 
um, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already or to um, subscribe to my newsletter uh, and yes I hope I'll uh, meet you somewhere uh, soon if possible as like on some conference or even a project or something like that so yes thanks a lot for watching and bye